Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Kavi Pasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm just gonna let you know that this is a part of the United People's Institute of Science series. It's currently available to continue and learn more about on the channel Mike Jesus Langer. You can find a link in the description down below, or you can hit that eye up in the top corner and see more about this story. And now, on to tonight's story. I barely noticed the letter peeking out of the stack of bills. After six months of asking for work but never hearing back, I'd given up hope. Yet there it was. A letter from a job I'd forgotten I applied to. Dear Comrade, We're pleased to announce that you have been chosen for the post of groundskeeper at the building formerly known as the United People's Institute of Science. As mentioned in the advert, your daily payments will be sent in cash to your mailing address. You are expected to report for the evening shift tomorrow, 1600 to 400. Due to the history of the facility, we are unable to provide a direct address, but attached is a satellite imagery that will guide your way. Once you reach the edge of the forest, keep on heading north. The foliage around the facility is quite distinctive. Once you see the trees start to wither, you know you are headed in the right direction. In B. Surrounding the Institute, there is a ditch filled with water. Avoid it. If the water makes any contact with your skin, immediately contact your supervisor. Near the building of the facility, there is a guard shack. This is where you are to spend the majority of your time. If you need to contact your supervisor, there is a phone. There is also a cabinet of tools in case your work requires it. Upon arriving at work, you are to number one, Ensure the door to the facility is not obscured in any way. If any items have been placed in front of the facility, remove them. If they cannot be removed without the aid of machinery, contact your supervisor. Bolt cutters, a blowtorch, and a crowbar are available in the tool cabinet. Do not contact the supervisor unless you are certain the problem cannot be handled by you alone. NB, do not open the door once it is unblocked. Number two, search the area for vagrants. If you find any vagrants that are alive and in the vicinity of the building or inside of your shack, instruct them to go inside the facility. Tell them they are entitled to free food and liquor inside. And B, do not follow the vagrants into the facility. In the unfortunate event of a corpse being found on the premises, do not contact the city police. The building that was formerly known as the United People's Institute of Science is not within their jurisdiction. If corpses are found, contact your supervisor. Number three, return to the shack and monitor the grounds. Once you are certain that the door to the facility is accessible and that no unaccounted individuals are around, you are to return to your shack and monitor the grounds from inside. If anyone approaches the facility without prior warning, contact your supervisor. With the exception of special circumstances, the bulk of your work will be monitoring the grounds between shifts. You are not to leave the workstation for any reason. Any intrusion on the grounds is to be reported immediately. Do not communicate with the potential threat and simply wait for your supervisor to deal with the issue. NB, the city police do not have any authority near the building that was formerly known as the United People's Institute of Science. Do not cooperate. At 2358, you will hear a siren. This signals the arrival of the midnight shift at the facility. It is your responsibility to verify their identity badges. At no point are you to make eye contact with the members of the midnight shift. You are to turn your chair away from the window slot and wait for identification papers to be presented to you. Once in possession of the documents, you are to read out the names and badge numbers to your supervisor. Once no new documents are presented, you are to wait for the siren to stop. Do not turn around until the siren stops. Once the midnight shift is out of sight, you are to return back to monitoring the grounds of the facility. In the rare instance the door to the facility is left open, you are free to go home early. And B, do not under any circumstances enter or look inside of the building formerly known as the United People's Institute of Science. After 0400, you are free to go home. Your wage of 15,000 tenge will be posted to your mailing address. Unless informed otherwise, you are expected to arrive back for work at 1600. 
Glory to the labor. Signed, Custodian Markarov. The directions to my new workplace were heavily censored. Whilst I could make out the street names that hugged the edge of the forest, everything beyond the initial grouping of trees was blacked out with a marker. The rulers and description of the job raised additional questions, but my eyes remained locked on the promise of a salary. That night I went to sleep early, excited about the chance at a life that doesn't involve regular visits to the Ministry of Labor. As I found myself drifting off, however, an odd phrase crept into my mind. Gilimi Kondirji. The building formerly known as the People's Institute of Science was occasionally referred to by this name, but the name would only be uttered in the most select of paranoid circles. The institute was only called Gilimi Kondirji in old wives' tales to terrify children, and by grizzled drunks whose only grasp on reality had slipped beyond help. Back when the Soviets still ruled the country, the People's Institute of Science was a research facility. That was all that was known of it. Somewhere around the early 2000s, there was hushed news of Russian soldiers traveling in the woods. But that information seemed to be more connected to the constant speculation about the Institute rather than any factual evidence. Whenever the Institute was mentioned, people spoke of forbidden knowledge and vengeful spirits. But I never considered myself particularly superstitious. For a moment, the thought of the stories behind it stirred me in my bed. Even thinking of the name disturbed me. Yet soon enough, memories of the Ministry of Labor washed out the thoughts of abandoned science facilities. Every two weeks, I was required to appear at the Ministry to reiterate my inability to find work. Every two weeks, I had to meet with the same angry clerk. The man had a very peculiar mole right above his mouth. Whenever he would berate me, the strange piece of flesh would bounce above his lip like a destructive basketball trapped in an office. With hopes of never visiting the Ministry of Labor again, I drifted off to sleep. Last Christmas, my mother bought me a thermos and a sandwich press. When I left the house for my new job, the air had sharp, cold teeth. Yet the hot thermos and fresh toasted ham and cheese sandwich provided me warmth. That warmth slowly grew to a need to call my mother tell her about my new job, to thank her for the gifts and care. But by the time I picked up my phone, I was out of signal range. The forest had no coverage. Even if there was signal, I would have to wait for my mother to call me back. My phone has long been without credit. All that I could use it for is sending call requests, accepting calls and bulk loading Reddit posts off my neighbor's Wi-Fi. I made a mental note to call my mother after my first shift and kept on walking through the forest. Even though each breath of the frigid air pained my lungs, there was a semblance of tranquility in the woods. Aside from my footsteps on the leaves and the occasional crackling twigs, the universe was completely silent. No birds, no wind, no wildlife, just the forest and me. Then a screaming foreigner ran down the forest path. The man wore a heavy motorcycle jacket. It would have looked intimidating in the dim lighting of a roadside bar, yet in the middle of the forest he looked utterly absurd. I didn't understand a word that he was yelling at me, but that didn't dissuade me from screaming even louder. For a couple of minutes I tried to figure out if he needed something, if he was lost or hurt. But it quickly became apparent that our language gap couldn't be crossed on a timer. Not wanting to be late for my first day at work, I pointed the way to the nearest road and bid the man goodbye. Sure, the right thing would have been to make sure the guy was alright, but I wanted to make a good first impression at my new job. I wanted to keep my new job. For a moment, the lush green forest around me started to trouble me. Was I going in the right direction? The forest just seemed like a regular forest, no change in the foliage, no Soviet science facility in sight. I checked the time on my phone every two minutes, but then my mind calmed. Trees in front of me started to grow sickly. The bushes shed their leaves and turned into tortured wooden grasps. Soon enough, the forest around me turned gray and dead. The foliage around the facility is quite distinctive. I was on the right track. The trees grew progressively thinner and bent until there was none at all. It was as if the big cement block that lay in front of me had seeped out every ounce of life from the land around it. The building that was formerly known as the People's Institute of Science stuck out of the dead earth as if it was a tombstone of an inhuman corpse, like a metallic crown of lenses. A mess of spotlight sat on top of the Institute, 
The eyes of the electric lanterns were dim. I felt as if they were all looking at me. Nearby was the guard shack the letter had mentioned. I breathed a sigh of relief. It was exactly 0700. I confidently walked into the shack, prepared to make a good impression on my supervisor, yet the shack was empty. I was alone. For a couple of minutes, I waited by the phone, expecting some sort of phone call to make sure that I'm at work, but when no one came, I decided to do the actual work I was being paid for. Just as the letter had said, there was a ditch filled with water surrounding the building of the Institute. The moat stank of old socks, and something seemed to be moving in the water, but it was easy enough to jump over and ignore. I took a walk around the concrete block and didn't find any vagrants dead or alive. The big double door to the facility, however, had a metal lock on it. The thing was clapped on tight, but the bolt cutters on the tool cabinet made quick work of the fixture. I walked a couple more circles around the facility to check for vagrants, and then I went to the guard shack. It was 16.40. I still had nearly seven hours of doing nothing until midnight. I started to search the shack for the supervisor's number, just so I would be prepared if the need arose. I did not find it. After closer inspection, however, I realized the number wouldn't be much use anyway. The phone had no dial pad, it was just a black box with a receiver. Out of curiosity, I picked up the phone. What is the nature of your emergency? A female voice strained through the static aft. I explained there was no emergency and introduced myself. A couple of seconds into my introduction, the voice cut me off. Monitor the facility grounds until you hear the siren. Only contact your supervisor in case of emergency or to verify documents. Then she hung up. The receiver did not go silent, however. A strange electric hiss started to grow on the other side. It was as if the static itself was trying to repeat the woman's words, as if the strange misfires of circuitry were trying to achieve sentience. I hung up the phone. It was making me feel uncomfortable. I spent a good chunk of the time staring at the open field of the Institute. The stillness of the silence, it was all sort of calming. But then I got bored. By the time the sun set and the spotlights of the Institute lit up, my phone battery was at 50%. I was hopping back and forth between browsing through interesting Ask Reddit threads and gazing out at the cement structure. The things on my phone were interesting to read, but looking out at that perfectly square construction in the woods, sensing the way the light fixtures slowly followed me through the shack, it was all quite hypnotic. My job was tranquil, and the promised pay was good. As I sat in the shack, I found myself drifting off to daydreams. I was never going to see the clerk with the mole again. I could pay off all my debts. I could date. In my mind, a new future was starting to manifest. The siren quickly chased it out. The shrill sound coming from the wall startled me, but I got into position as quickly as I could. I placed my chair against the window and stared at the wall. I would do as the letter told me to do, keep my eyes to myself and just read out the documents. The siren eventually quieted down into a low buzz. The lights on the facility went dim. Only the small light in my shack kept the darkness at bay. Outside, staggered footsteps approached. I hoped that I could strike up some conversation with the members of the midnight shift and maybe better my chances of securing steady employment, but these people did not speak. They simply passed me their documents to the window slot and ignored any of my small talk. I did as I was told. The documents I was passed were simple enough to understand. All that was present was a name, a badge number, and a picture. These were definitely scientist types. They all wore glasses. I read out their names and badge numbers into the phone one by one. The supervisor grunted in each response to each name. Dr. Nikolsky, badge number so-and-so. Mm. Dr. Krimsky, badge number so-and-so. Mm. Dr. Nowak, badge number so-and-so. Mm. Once no new badges were presented, the siren picked up again. I shouted into the phone, asking the supervisor if there was something else I was meant to do. Has Dr. Vitek appeared? The voice asked. I told her I didn't know, but that I could ask the midnight crew. You are not to look at or communicate with any of the employees. Remain seated until the siren ends and then go back to monitoring the grounds. She hung up. I quickly put the phone down before the horrid static started up again. 
The siren dragged on into the night, and it didn't make for pleasant company. But when it finally quieted down, I found myself appreciating the calmness of my new job even more. The lights on top of the facility did not turn on after the siren went quiet, but there was plenty of moonlight to convince me that no one was sneaking around the ground. The metal double doors of the building was shut. It was a couple minutes after midnight. I finished reading the rest of the post I had saved on my phone and ate the sandwich I was too nervous to eat before. I kept the last 5% of my phone battery to tell the time. As soon as the digital clock struck 0400, I was out the shack and on my way back. By the time I got back home, there was an envelope in my mailbox. 15,000 Tengi. No additional letter. I counted and recounted the money for longer than I would care to admit. Then I called my mother. She's always been quite superstitious, so I simply told her I was hired as a groundskeeper at a government facility and skipped any specifics. Even without details, she was overjoyed that I had found some form of employment. After I got off the phone with her, I counted the money one more time, then passed out. My next shift contained no vagrants, no locks or corpses. I simply got paid to show up and stare at an empty field and read some name badges from a grunting supervisor. Dr. Vitek didn't show up that night or any of the other nights. Yet every shift, the supervisor still asked about him. At first, I was happy about the money, about the possibility of digging myself out of debt. But after a couple of shifts at the building that was formerly known as the People's Institute of Science, I found myself troubled. There's a part of me that's curious about what is on the other side of that door. Did I wonder what happens inside of the Institute on the first night? Obviously. As satisfied as I was in that shack, the temptation of the unknown called to me, my mind filled with various explanations for the different rules the letter dictated. I found myself thinking back to the scary stories around the campfire, trying to figure out what tales about the facility could actually be real. But I let go of those thoughts quickly. Even thinking of the horrible name gave me goosebumps. But more importantly, I knew what was on the other side of that door. The clerk with a strange mole. Sitting in that shack, I knew that if I were to open that door, I would be opening the door to getting fired, to having to spend countless hours filling up forms at the Ministry of Labor. The door was guarded by the clerk on the first night. He stood there reminding me what would happen if I disobeyed my faceless employer. The clerk's specter has kept me away on the first night. Yet my memories of him are starting to fade. And after a week of working at the building formerly known as the People's Institute of Science, I barely remember what the clerk looks like. I can still resist it. I can still ignore the strangeness that surrounds my job. Yet I fear that one day, one day soon, I may fall to temptation and look inside the building. I fear I might look inside and not like what I find. I fear that all the stories I hear about Ginnini Kondersi are true. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Goo Pasta. I want to tell you thank you so much for watching today's video on YouTube or listening to today's episode of the podcast on the podcast. For those of you guys who like listening to me here, maybe you like listening to me do behind the scenes shit uh, stuff. You can always do that at twitch.tv slash mrcreepypasta. I Twitch stream sometimes. And when I Twitch stream, it's usually either playing very random video games or doing work like you're currently hearing me do right now. I always love seeing you guys. I always love hearing from you guys. So if you wanted to pop in and listen to me work or pop in and backseat game, then hey, you're always welcome to do so. I always appreciate a follow there. And of course, like always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who supports me at patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta. You guys, as always, are the main MVPs of this story of every night's story, and you guys help me keep the lights on here. So, without further ado, I want to give a very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tanya Oren, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, That One Guy, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Rebecca Harper, Murky Moo, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Caddo Baker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob Like Sharp Things, Chaos Art, Cryolinian, Milk and Meal, Zachary Graphius, Gorang Tramagasi, Maria Walker, Pain 
Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver, Matt Bach, Jabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, Nick Weaver, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Holly Sue, Guy Mara Ravenswood, William King, Garth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Sazaku, Croconut 509, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Trickin, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Zaccardi, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Guy Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, thank you guys so very, very much. Thank all of you who are in the description down below, and honestly, thank all of you that can give anything, even when it comes down to just $1. I appreciate you guys very, very much. Sweet dreams.